Welcome back to the Four Wheel Drive Podcast, driven by Shelter. That's the Southern River Band. Again, let it ride. The Four Wheel Drive Podcast on Instagram and YouTube. You'll find us at Backchat Studios. Ronnie, we're back for a special episode, mate. Pretty exciting this special one. Special indeed, this um, one. I don't want to. I don't want to talk for too long. I want to get into this, but uh, can you set us up a little bit? What we're going to look at today? Yeah, we need definitely need to set the area and set sort of the scene. The interview we're going to look at, which is with a friend of mine, Nina. That's going to tell the rest of the story. But um, the basis of it is in the south, or the east, south, the south of WA to the east. I nearly said southwest east, <laughs> <laughs> mixing it up there a bit. So it's towards, you know, towards the other end of WA. It's a huge state. And that is probably the last area I would call is the south, southern, wild west. It is crazy remote uh so much wildlife it's kind of untouched area so we're talking about the air highway where you got cocklebitty so you go south of cocklebitty takes you about four hours roughly to get down to a place called twilight cove now twilight cove is on the edge of the baxter cliffs very very remote not many people go there um to the east of that we have the air bird observatory now to get to that it's a bit of a treacherous drive can be if you're not you haven't been there before, a lot of seaweed, a lot of sand, a lot of rocks, a lot of headlands you've got to drive inland to get around, to get to. So it's about a, um, a good couple of hours from one location to the other to get back to the highway. And um, that's where Nina was attempting to go on some bad advice. So I think we can look at the interview. Let's have a look at it. How you going, Nina? Good. How are you? Oh, I'm not too bad. Thank you very much. Where are you right now? Green. It's amazing. Enjoying the weather. It's just yes. miserable down here. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to coming back to Perth. You were on your way to Queensland and you wanted to check out Twilight Cove. A few people recommended it. I was one of them. I know you loved it. Just give us a quick brief on what you thought about Twilight Cove. It's magical, Ronnie. It's beautiful on the end of the world. No one's around. You feel like you're in a, yeah, in a different time zone, really. Adol, heaps of animals and heaps going on there and it's beautiful for photography and smashing time in an yeah. epic location no one else around although you did pass someone on your way in who recommended that you check out the air bird observatory which is 30 k to the east yep. of twilight cove where you were camping yeah how remote would you say that area is uh, on first glance, it doesn't look that remote but really once you're there you realize it's yeah you're very far away from anybody and the yeah. landscape changes really fast. Let's take us to that moment. Like you broke camp early in the morning. I understand you crashed your drone as well. So it wasn't a good start to the day. You were keen to get back out in the highway to go the fast way, which some locals told you about, Bird yeah. Observatory. You're driving along at low tide, I understand. Yeah, about 6.30 in the morning. Talk us from that point where you start noticing beach going narrow and then when to when you got bogged. And how did you get bogged? There's a lot of weeds on top of the sand, but I'd heard about these bear traps that underneath the yeah, the beach closed in, so I wanted to get to the high road and turn around. Instead of what I should have done was just stop and turn around. So I went straight over a section of only a couple of meters of what looked like hard sand and just sank. So you were actually going to turn around? Yeah, and go back. You were trying to avoid the situation and then you know, yeah. right in the middle of it. Yeah. Man, let's just set the scene here. you got no winch, right? But you had the max tracks, and I've gone through some photos that you sent me, and I can see the max tracks are underneath the vehicle. Duh. First of all, when you sunk it, what was your first thoughts? First thoughts was we're stuck, proper stuck. When I saw and tried to test that seaweed and realized that it was solid, I knew that I couldn't dig or get my jack in there. I was, yeah, feeling pretty lost because I knew I couldn't maybe get myself out. Sinking feeling. So, yeah, sinking, literally. Most people who haven't been down that way or, or on WA beaches don't realise how soft and how deep this seaweed can get. I mean, this is decades of storms and sand and seaweed just collecting, collecting, making an absolute soup and a mess of things. You're stuck there. you got Teddy in the car. You're by yourself. What's the next thing you do? Um, after swearing a lot, at nothing, I got my Scarman in reach. It's like a hiking device with an e So okay. it's, before I hit the road, when I built this troop out last year, it was this or a sat phone. Okay. I opt into this. So I can text people my location and send very basic text, like on an old Nokia. 
So you can't make calls from it, but you can text from it. So I sent out a couple of messages to two people to help. One local knowledge with the road house, and the other one being my mum. She called Airbird. You text them to get them the ring to try and get someone down to help you out. And yeah. I understand that um, there was no luck with the roadhouse because it was Australia Day. But the Bird Observatory people, the caretakers, they came down to assist or? Yeah, so they have a work highlights that they get when they stay there. So they can't tow or anything with that. They just came down to look at it. They thought they could dink me out. Um, but I already knew by the time they got down there at midday, I been there for six hours nearly. That's a long time, yeah. We weren't digging it out. So I had to leave. The, the first question they asked me was, do I have lockers? Um, which probably was going on. It might help, but looking at how stuck you are, I don't, don't you know, don't know, I don't think you would have got out. It's but, hard yeah. to say. I mean, you was, there was so much suction on that. It was going through the other photos and progressing how it went. So I understand that you had to leave the vehicle on the edge of tide line. And they took yourself and Teddy back to uh, the homestead and you spent the night there. Yeah. So we, but we came back at sunset with their personal car to try and get Oh, the out. same day? The okay. same day. But they had a very heavy tar and they were afraid of driving on the beach, even though by the time we came back, it was low tide again. We just needed a straight pull. They sat to my left and essentially pulled me into the, crap even like pretty much sang me straight yeah one to it so i had okay. to leave my car again on the same day oh no they didn't want to risk their car which you can kind of understand a little bit but yeah they made it worse so good intentions but end up worse off and that's a that's that's a tough one isn't it that's yeah and it was uh they said just grab what's valuable my whole car is valuable it's my home what's well, your, so, your home on wheels so i just took teddy's Clothes and my camera and the laptop. <laughs> no clothes for me. What a situation. So how long's the vehicle been sitting there for now and how long has it avoided water? And as I checked tide times, I didn't know the height. So we we didn't have a change in high tide for three days. So I knew I had three days to get me off. How much high was that tide coming? Do you remember? It was a king tide. It would have taken me yeah, My car would have... Oh, oh, it was a king tide. The, the height is like... Over Dublin. Yeah. Wow. Things. Yeah. Stress levels. High. And then the next morning we had a message from Nuclear Towing that said they'll come. Re reluctant? Or? So after much back and forth, they thought I was some silly tourist, which is fair. They had a lot of bad bobbins around that area. Eventually they got their neighbor who was mad enough to tag along. So they brought two vehicles and they got to me at maybe two or three p.m. The guys from Eucala finally came down. How happy were you to see them and tell us how they got you out? I was on one hand super happy, but also not because the next the day before we tried to get it out and didn't work, but they were very confident that they could get it out. He was in an old 80 series and no winch. He was happy to snatch me out. The problem was when we tried to snatch me out, I had suction so much onto that seaweed that the car wouldn't move. He had to use a high lift jack with wood and basically created an air pocket. Yeah. And then we shoved the wood underneath. I remember I think it was the rear bar or the wheel or something to keep that pocket and then get it out once we had created that gap. It That's was awesome. Tricky. You got some old tilers who knew what they were doing. They were so uh, old and mad. Experienced. Yeah. Experienced. Old, mad, wise, got you out. Yeah. You must be so happy. I was, uh, I was screaming. <laughs> open it, not yeah. crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, oh, so, good stuff. And then I ate for the first time in nearly three days. <laughs> I bet you that tasted good too. <laughs> yeah. What would you advise people who end up in the same situation or maybe be prepared for a situation like this? Be prepared to have money to get you out for starters. Okay. Because that That's a good one. ordeal cost me four and a half thousand dollars. Secondly, good people you can tap that you can rely on, which leads into definitely hunting a sat phone or a gun. Um, yeah. Maybe tell more people where you're going. I felt okay. I told a couple of people I was going and they're the ones I messaged. And also know your insurance, what your insurance will cover. Insurance is a big one. Yeah. I knew my insurance would cover and I rang them and they said, don't worry, if the ocean takes your car, we'll just cut him out. To the value and on the were, car, but not, not like a home on wheels. To, to my value that I put on there, but it, you know, it has all my stuff and 
it's not just my four-wheel driving car, it's my house. So I didn't obviously want that option. So my biggest thing was I followed bad instruction and I knew in the pit of my stomach that I was going against what I already knew and had been told. At the end of the day, it's not on fault but my own, but you really need to forward plan a lot better. And I thought I already was a full financer. So, so glad you got your car out and happy for you and Teddy and you got your vehicle clean and free from rust. All, it's all good. Yeah. Looking good from here on. Maybe go, go by the pool and have a cocktail after reflecting on all that. You probably need it. Oh yeah. We're going to Matt's place for lunch and I'm traveling up. Oh, sorry. nice. All right, Nina. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks. It's a fascinating story, mate, and, and Nina, thank you for coming on and, and obviously doing the interview with yourself, Ronnie. It's, uh, it, it's great to see Nina's story, the honesty, and obviously we've spoken about yeah. earlier episodes that sometimes it can be a little bit embarrassing, a, a it decent can be. blogging like that, but um, thank you to Nina for, for doing that for us and supplying the footage and, and all of that for us. It was great insight. Um, crazy, crazy, yeah. So, like, first of all, thanks for, you know, because it can be quite embarrassing with these yep. bloggings, but also hats off to how she handled it yeah and you know having a toddler with you as well which i'm not sure i mentioned at the start but oh. that that's that's next level right yeah you know you gotta care for and she mentioned it's a it's a home on wheels like that that was more than just her four-wheel drive yeah but she, she lives out of that it. king tide yeah. so incredible story and and even the way she uh she handled that interview she you can tell that she was um quite cool and calm and composed and she knew what she had to do but obviously she needed some help in in that area so a, an amazing story Mate, uh, just for a bit more reference, we spoke about the south and the west and the south southwest and stuff that you <laughs> talked about before. But um, so, the, the people that have ended up coming out to help her, so Cocklebitty Roadhouse is four hours from Twilight Cove. It's four hours if you if you you know take a nice careful drive yep, down. You can get there faster. You probably but, should do in that area. Yeah, yeah. So the people that have come to save her, the the fellas that we saw in the photo there, they've come from Eucla. Yeah, that's like so, four hundred k's. Still. Yeah, that's like near the border and. And look, we are already far east, like at Cocklebitty. It's just WA is so huge. It, it it can take longer than a day to get out of WA. Yep. From Perth. So there's a little bit of, I suppose, that these bikes have probably gone at least six hours, maybe, to, uh, to yeah, help her out there. Probably, yeah, six to seven hours yep. to get down there. Um, and they would have known the area, like, the, you know, don't know the area. They're, they're, you could say they're local. There's not really anyone that's <laughs> local to that area, but yep. they're as local as you're going to get 400 k's away. Yeah. Yep. That's why this place is so remote, you know? Yeah. It's um, a it, team effort. Well yeah. and truly. So, mate, let's break it down a little bit. Obviously, I've been stuck in that, that it looks like tight, compact sand with a little bit of that seaweed cover on top, and I've fallen into the same trap as Nina. And it, I haven't. I had to wait for three days to have my car pulled out. I had to wait three minutes for a car to come past in Esperance and, and just give me an, an easy snatch out. But it's a tough spot to be in. Obviously, she wanted to turn around. She could see that it probably was a lo- looking a little bit sketchy up ahead. Yeah. But once you find yourself in that, like the, the there's me in, in half of it. Um, but it, it, it just takes your car. It just it swallows it. I was on a path and all of a sudden I'm diving to the left. And I'm sure Nina would have had a, a similar experience. But once you're in this stuff, it's, because it's, it's yeah. got such a wet underbody. It almost just... There's no getting out without help. You can't dig out. You can't... It no. It just falls back in on itself. And yeah. There was like the brown muddy looking stuff on her tire. Like, yeah. What's that? So that's that's from decades of, of just sand and seaweed, just seaweed decomposing, you know? So it's like compost. Right. <laughs> and it's it's crazy. Now, there's, there's another vehicle down there that's been there for years. Now, or a couple of backpackers, they... Um, they went on the wrong, hand, wrong side of the seaweed. There's a big pile of seaweed closer to the air bird observatory towards yep. the other end. So kind of on the other end going that way. And um, they, they got caught out in the wrong side. They would have got a bit bogged. That car got lost. They ended up spending uh, the night there. And then in the morning, they got rescued by the uh, you know, air bird observatory yep. caretakers. Right. They had to leave all their swags and stuff. I did a, I did a tag along tour and we saw the swags there. So that's when we knew about the story. We saw the car and then year by year, the car slowly disappearing and changing right. where it is and stuff. So it's once your vehicle gets stuck in that kind of stuff and you can't get it out yourself, um, you can pretty much count your vehicle gone. But yep. she got really lucky. Now, some people who uh, have seen this story or, or hearing about the story, they may think that she was unprepared, but she was actually quite prepared. Yeah. Um, you know, calm, composure, uh, 
Yeah, as you have to be because you've got a child on board. But having having the means to actually message out and, yeah. It could have been a lot worse had it, she not been as prepared as she was. For yeah, sure. it yeah. could have been a lot worse. And she, she could also identify that, hey, this is starting to get bad. So it's not like she kept punching on and, and maybe got stuck somewhere even yeah. worse. Yep. I mean, that, that that's probably as bad as it's going to get. It actually can get worse because you've got these headlands. You got you used to be able to drive around them, but after a while, all this seaweed just keeps going in and it's impossible to see where the holes are because you're going over a rocky reef. Yep. And with seaweed, you can't see it. You yeah, can't even walk on it. You know, cut your feet up, you fall in a hole, break an ankle. It's yep. pretty treacherous, Yeah. that seaweed stuff. And just really in WA, you sort of really get that and South Australia on the south coast. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So I suppose Nina's advice there at the end of the video, just to be as prepared as you can. The, the, I, the as four, we were watching, I, and she mentioned about having the money that yeah, she the four needed. Grand, to, five grand. I, I, was, I was shocked. So yeah. is that just the people coming to help? That would have been to pay the people to yep. come and help. Yeah. Um, now, I don't know if her insurance company would have covered that. Probably not. But the thing is, she was in a situation where it's like, you know what? I'll, I'll pay the four and a half or five grand, whatever it was, to get the car out. Because the like you said, the car's covered in insurance, right? But it doesn't cover the roof conversion and all this stuff. Yeah. She, she's she's put a lot of effort into building this vehicle to what it is. She, that's her house. So... All, all her personal stuff, everything is in that car. Yep. So if she lost that, it'll be like someone losing a house. Yep. You know. Yep. I forgot to mention at the start too, it's a pretty nice setup. It is. It's a pretty it's good a setup. Good looking troopy. Yeah, yeah. And so obviously she mentioned that she's up in Broome in a bit of warmer weather at the moment. So she's she's made it much past here. She's still got the same car, I'm assuming. She's, yeah, she's all yeah. good. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that's in the car park and she was in a hotel room there. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> oh, that's It's very good news. I don't think there, there shouldn't be too much bog trouble up there um, on those beaches. But uh, something I um, I noted when we were watching the video, the, the textbook operation that, I think you might have mentioned it, but the textbook operation that the, the fellas did to get her out, what was that? Oh, so the digging, like the if you yeah, if you notice on the photos, there was there was a lot of digging that had been done. Yeah, so, like so opened up a big channel almost. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like they even formed like it was like two walls of sand, one wall of seaweed, one wall of sand. Yep. So they really got in there and dug it out, and that would have made the recovery a lot less as well because how bogged she was, and then when the other guys from the Airbird Observatory were trying to help her out, but just made it worse by pulling her further into it. There's so much suction on it because it's like mud, as you can see on that tire shot we saw. Yep. So a lot of these photos we're seeing now, they're like kind of in the process of getting out and, and that because obviously in, in a situation like that. That's incredible to think that that's under there. Yeah, it's it's crazy and it stinks. Yeah, it doesn't. <laughs> and it's full of it like sea like lice. Dog and shit, dog shit, to be honest. It does look like dog shit. <laughs> and it's a dog shit <laughs> that, situation. That's, yeah, it is. It honestly has, has a stench pretty similar to that. Right. You know. Um, you know, maybe <laughs> maybe a vegetarian dog, but <laughs> uh, anyway. yeah, there's a lot of um, a lot you know, of research going into that, that yeah. seabed kelp stuff that people are eating. Yeah. Anyway, that maybe another episode. Um, I wouldn't eat it in a survival situation. <laughs> nah. Well, uh, Nina didn't eat for three days. No, but, she didn't. Was that just nerves. I think I think probably the stress, and then because all the stuff's in the car, right? Yeah. And and I think I think actually the main reason is is because she's she needs to look after Teddy. Teddy, yeah. The toddler. And and like just knowing what that's like, you know, just even camping with kids sometimes, I, I forget to eat sometimes because you're just constantly making them food, you yep. know. Kids yep. are bloody hungry, you know. Yeah. Always <laughs> bloody growing too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, impressive. It, it, this area though is one of your favourites, isn't it? Like you'd love Mate, this, this area. This area is so good. The Twilight and, Cove itself. Yeah. Which is a bit further back from this stretch of yeah. beach. So Twilight Cove is where we normally end. Yeah, okay. that tag along that we that we that we used to run. I don't run tag alongs anymore. Just too busy with all these podcasts and yeah, you know, yeah, busy man. <laughs> so um, we would normally start from Balladonia, head south, and then go across, or then we went to Esperance and go across. So either those two ways, and then that takes you from Esperance to Israelite Bay, then to Point Culver, which is the other side of the Baxter Cliff. So you got Point Culver. The opposite side is is Twilight Cove. So the Baxter Cliff comes in and becomes the escarpment but it goes out becomes a cliff and then comes back in and nina was staying at a twilight cove side so on the other side of the baxter yep uh the eastern side of the baxter cliffs so it's a huge area and just going across though that uh, the baxter cliff driving up there it takes two days 
and it is grueling and it is max speed is like 20 kilometers per hour average speed is like 13 kilometers an hour right it's very hard on your vehicles um best place ever to run a tag along or just to travel and check out but you got to travel in numbers yep i think nina's the perfect example of that she was on her way towards uh queensland i did suggest for her to check it out and she's always wanted to check it out um a couple other people also suggested that but um so you're not taking full blame no well (laughs) i did i did say to her um don't go you know don't drive along the beaches or anything like that but the problem was she passed someone that advised her oh you should go down that way you know it's it's all good we just came from there yep okay but saying saying you just came from there you got to be more descriptive with the track that goes inland and and all that stuff so we didn't think she was going to do that otherwise i would have given her the whole roadmap for it but i don't want to send someone down a track like that especially with with a toddler because even if you get a flat tire no one comes there yeah right but she was lucky to have that in reach garment if she didn't have that car would have been gone i reckon yeah yep um, it's interesting because because obviously we've spoken a little bit about it now and, and the love that you have for the area and obviously you, Nina, a friend of yours, wanted to experience that same thing and obviously she's been keen to check it out and then it goes so wrong like this. Um, it doesn't with, say much. Without help. Yeah, it's just, you yeah. know, uh, reiterate how, you know, Nina, obviously you don't have a car like that and not be well prepared and set up and, and have some know-how on how to get out of a situation like this. But um, yeah. Yeah, it just the the points proven there that you just you need to be ready to go, especially if you're going this remote. But I, I did want to touch on this area. If you, I, I encourage people to look up Twilight Cove on the map or Cocklebiddy and and just have a look. If you haven't done the Nullarbor before, see where this is and just look at how remote it is. It's pretty remote, eh? but and the history that it's got for through so the much history is down there, incredible. You touched on it a little bit before before we started, but yeah, yeah. So there's there's like layers of history. You know, the the bit that I spoke about was like uh, the first sort of um, uh, white man first to go, walk across. You know, that was John uh, John Baxter, um, and it was uh, John Eyre as well, and that's why the the Bird Observatory is um, is a John Eyre or the Eyre Bird Observatory. That used to be a telegraph thing. I'll get to that one in a sec. But yeah, they they went across. There's some pretty cool history there. But I yep. think we'll leave that one for later because it's a pretty good story. Yep. But then there's also telegraph uh, lines out there, yeah. which have gone across. And then in between all that, there's also the Afghan uh, couriers. And that's one of the things that's not really talked about in in a lot of the history in WA is, and even like across most, of, like a lot of Australia, the yeah. Afghan couriers. You yeah. know, that's why all the camels are here. Um, if anyone wanted something, yeah, out in the middle of nowhere, it'll be a Afghan courier that would yeah. take it out there. It seems like such a forgotten part of Australia. Like everything's, yeah, you know, the, the, obviously Eastern states a lot more spoken about because WA is so vast and wide, and this this whole stretch is just quite untouched like you say but there's there's still that that history out there yeah there's so um, many layers for the last couple of hundred years and then obviously you know the aboriginal people who've been here for for thousands of thousands of years all all that history through there would just be incredible to, to tap yeah. into i would say um, yeah there were yeah there would have been heaps of activity out there yeah I, I reckon just you know um and then there's also um Israelite bay which was um the main telegraph station that would get news from adelaide to perth as well you yeah know? Okay. so that that telegraph line even though they only used it for a number of years yeah um before that it took two weeks to get news from adelaide to perth right so this just made it like same day kind of stuff yep you know yep Euclid's probably the most known one out there, most yeah. accessible, which I've, I've had a look at myself. Yep. But um, knowing that they're scattered all through through that country down there is, yeah, it's incredible to think it's even there. Yeah, um, and, and the wildlife down there, this is, uh, this is truly the uh, wild east of the wild west. <laughs> <laughs> Figure out where that is, people, and come back to me because I've got no idea. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yeah, well, it's down that way. The it's, only one uh, you haven't mentioned is north, so yeah. it's like we're dealing with the south coast <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Um, we were down there once and we counted uh, 22 snakes between us, the group of five of us. Right. Um, we counted 22 snakes dead and alive. What snake? What? Uh, mainly dugots. Yeah. A um, couple of brown snakes, but it was mainly, mainly dugots. Um, they're very curious creatures down there. Like if you find a dugot, uh, you know, in your Perth, Perth suburbs, they will just bugger off yep. pretty quick because, you know, they are used, they know human activity. Yep. It's not going to end well. 
either way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but down there, um, I've I've got a few photos on my phone, um, uh, which I'll show you. But I, I've we spotted some because you can see them in the white sands of Bilbao Dunes. Now, Bilbao Bilbao Dunes is between Israelite Bay, um, which is the old telegraph station, and Point Culver, so before the Baxter Cliffs, and you got these massive dunes. They're like, they are the biggest dunes on some form of scale, but I can't remember what it is. So I'm not going to say it because I used to think it was the Southern Hemisphere, but I don't think it is. Not but the south of the south. I think Asian. they're the biggest ones in in Australia. Right. I think so. Bill Bunya. Bill Bunya dunes. Never heard of them. Look it up. It is massive. Um, so you spot the snakes there so easy because they're kind of like a dark green brown. Right. Um, so I've sat down a few times, got a few photos, and they'll come right up to you because they're curious. They're not sure if you're a threat or not. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're just not used to people. I'm not sure, yeah. How far do you let them, like how, how close do you let them get to you? I like snakes. Um, you like snakes? I, I love snakes, yeah. Really? Favourite animal. Uh, I've had one get really close because I was trying to get a really nice um, like video of it. This is another one at Bill Bunya, another time. And I forgot that my car was behind me. So I turn around and walk off, walk straight into the bull bar. <laughs> I'd be climbing that thing out of there. Um, but the one where I got the photo, we had that bit of a moment with the Jew guy. That was, that was pretty cool. Come right up, probably about two meters away from me. And, um, and then it just sat there for a bit. And then when it started moving again, I thought, oh, you're getting a bit close here, mate. So I might just move away. Yeah. <laughs> you're with Ronnie Dale, Liam Duggan. This is the Four Wheel Drive Podcast, driven by Shelter. So, Bill Bunya Dunes, research, uh, tick, mate, biggest dunes in the Southern Hemisphere, reported to be, which I don't understand what that what means. What does that mean, um, reported to be? So, maybe it, at the time it was, I don't know, yeah. don't know what reported the biggest dunes in the Southern Hemisphere mean. I'm going to be honest, Jaden found it for me. Where'd you, where'd you find it, mate? 100 metres high. Yeah, um, I found it. I found it on Google, but I've closed the tab, so I'm actually going to have to... I'm gonna to have to open that one up again, boys. <laughs> just, oh, just, 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 just go on. I'll, I'll jump back in later. You just get back oh, to yeah. me about probably I'll Wikipedia back to you where yeah. you're finding that I'm info sorry, out, mate. mate. Um, <laughs> we we digress a little bit. We started talking about the area, and I think that was a, a great insight to people and how rugged and remote the area actually yeah. is. We um, need to bring it back, don't we? We we do need to bring it back. <laughs> so this this is about Nina and her story. I want to touch on, or I want you to touch on, Ronnie. The track in and getting from, say, Israelite Bay all the way to here or you're coming in from Cockle Beauty, wherever it is you're coming in from, how well equipped do you need? Your, like, is, do you need a vehicle that looks like Nina's or am I able to oh, take mate. a stock Ranger or Hilux down there? Yeah, look, if you're very experienced, you could take a stock Hilux or Ranger down there, but not with stock tyres. They yep. would get shredded straight away. Every single tag along we did in that region in general, tyres. Right. Tyres, tyres, tyres all the time. Track in. Um, the tracking's pretty rough. I mean, it goes over like, sand and it gets these really rocky sections. So you, you got to lower your tires because, but you can't lower them too much either. So you got to have fun at happy medium. But then when you get to the beach, you got to lower them Drop again the down. because otherwise, you know. Yep. But even like with fully deflated tires, she'd still she's probably sink in that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's trouble there. She's got a lot of gear in that car too, you know. It's pretty, yeah, it's pretty heavy. heavy. Mm. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't take, I wouldn't suggest taking a stock vehicle down there. Um, if you did go down there for the, for the day, you need some experience with full driving. Uh, definitely tell them at Cocklebitty that you're heading down there. Yeah. And um, but the problem is people don't say when they come out, they just go up, fill up and take off, you yep. know, get a sandwich or a toasty yeah. or whatever. Yep. So, yeah, and I, it's really remote. You really got to have communication with you and don't go down there yourself. That's what I'd also say. Yep. Um, and if you do go down there, and you go along that beach, it is, unless you know how to read the seaweed and all that, um, it's it's very difficult. You, you, sometimes you can't sell. It's sand on top and then you just sink through the yep. sand. It's like a salt it's lake. You through. can break through the crust yep. and then you're screwed. And if you come from the other side to get to Twilight Cove, well, you're going to need at least 650 litres, uh, sorry, 650 kilometres worth of fuel on board and then you got to work that out with what your vehicle burns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So there, yeah. Just be experienced or be with people. Yes, and be well equipped. Or, or be, be with people. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um. Now Nina obviously has been able to to contact and get help, and um, it took a little while, yes. but she's ended in a, in a it's a, a great outcome for her and, and Teddy. So if if there was no help or someone couldn't reach help or there was no options. This, it was Nina and Teddy out there 
and they needed this car out. King Tide was coming, obviously. The you know, yeah, terrible timing, unfortunately, for them with that. But so what, what are the options? We're talking worst case scenario. Here. Worst case scenario, you, you can't well, get help. What are your options in this? What are the options? Situation? Yeah. Well, look, you should always stay with your vehicle, um, but you know, depending on the weather and and all that, and if if she was aware of exactly where the uh, bird observatory was. She could have probably trekked towards there. Is there a facility there? There's there's a there's like an old museum, um, right. but it is a bird ob- observatory. So every six months they, or I think it's every three months or six months they they change caretakers. Right. So they they got this caretaker scheme all around Australia. So a lot of people, uh, usually old timers, they'll they'll travel from one caretaker place to another. Yep. And they really get to travel and see things, and they get to really like know the area to the point of like. Uh, they call it micro environments or okay. mi- micro nature because they notice why the birds are flying to a certain spot or why you know you really get to experience part of the seasons as well yeah whereas if you travel to an area yeah even though i've traveled to that area so many times like nine or ten times before um unless you spend a long time there you're not really going to see all the other bits that happen yep. Yeah, so I suppose so, knowing knowing the area that you're going to, so if area. that's Nina's first time, yeah, yeah, knowing that there's a bird observatory there could really be no, a, yeah. a lifesaver. Yeah, it it could be, but then your car. but then it kind of goes against the rules of leaving your car. Yeah, but in this situation, she probably doesn't have much choice. Yeah, because she's yeah, it's it's a very tough one, eh? Like I just wouldn't. Yeah, it's so tough. Like the best thing to do if you get stuck anywhere is to stay with your vehicle. Unless you have the local knowledge. Like if you're the farmer and your car breaks down on your property, well, you kind of know where you got to go and no one else is going to come yeah, there, right? Yeah. So it, it, it's a hard one. She's got a toddler on board. Obviously, you know, it might be a good idea to... It, it's down to that situation. I don't want to say that they should have walked or should have stayed because it's 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 hard to say. Yep. Yep. So yeah. then if there was... to so say there's no bird observatory and... Nina doesn't have a, a Garmin sat phone. Stay with the car. Stay with the car. Stay with the car. And then give me an option. What Now what do I do? Just okay. sit with the car for... Take the spare ever? tire off. Yep. Um, burn it. Get some black smoke happening. <laughs> and hopefully someone sees you. Yeah, right. You know, because you're, re- you're in a world I, of travel. I laugh, but that like these situations can potentially... Ha- happen on solo travel they, they can like, they can but like, yeah i probably shouldn't laugh can. at it but that's <laughs> yeah see is a that a bit, genuine option um yeah oh, wow. yeah it's a it's that's a that's a that's a survival option oh, yeah. yeah a lot of people probably shake their heads going why are you burning your spare tire well, the car's not going anywhere so let's make some black smoke and black smoke is usually indicating it's not a bushfire yeah there's yeah. something on fire yeah I'd- so that's that's out of uh out of bob cooper's textbook of survival right um yeah so wow. you, then you grab your second spare then you burn that one and if your car's completely stuffed well then you start pulling tires off and burn them too that is crazy <laughs> yeah it gets less about the car then doesn't it well it's it does it, it becomes getting your health getting and, yourself and your out and, yeah and your toddler yeah. um so rule of thumb stay with your car this situation where there's a tire that's going to hit it in a number of days well you can only stay with your car for so long yep then you're going to have to start moving if there was nothing else down there, well, I'd, I'd hate to think of what might what might happen. But usually on a track in the outback, then you may not see anyone for one day, two days, three days, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. But hopefully you've got enough food on board. Yep. Someone will eventually come past. Yes. But your car's easier to spot than a person wandering around in the bush yeah, aimlessly. Absolutely. Yep. Mm. So we've got, obviously, Nina's without a winch here. Yes. And no lockers either. And no lockers. So... Back to the more, uh, I suppose, basic stuff with a so winch. So, if she had a winch... She's got an option, doesn't she? Yeah. There's yeah. no trees, obviously, on the beach to winch from. No, there is not. But um, there could be some reef, maybe. But I wouldn't suggest that. But the other option is buried a tyre. Yeah. So, hopefully, you haven't burnt it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so Definitely there. try that before burning tyres. Yeah, especially if you've got a winch. Um, I mean, it would have taken her forever, but... She would have had a good anchor point if she would have spent the time, but then she's got to, you know. So just dig, yeah. dig a massive hole, throw yeah, that tire yeah. in there. Yeah, I mean toddlers like digging too. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> build a build a sandcastle with all the uh, the sand to the side. Yeah, the yeah. Um, so there is an option with a winch. There is there is there is an option there with a winch, and 
there is even an option to winch backwards, but it takes a bit of setting up, but maybe not in that situation because you would need some anchor points and trees for that. Yep. But she could definitely um, go forward from there. And once she prop, pops her wheels a bit higher up, then it's just the back end she's got to worry about. Yep. And then maybe even some max tracks with the winch or the wheel popped up, that'll probably get her out pretty quick. Yep. Yeah. Now, I want to touch on something just quickly. We've We've covered a bit there in terms of the recovery there's one little detail in the recovery that you picked up through the videos. Yes. Now, we don't want to name and shame anything or anyone here, but what was the one detail that you picked out there? Okay, so the one detail I picked out there was the the, the guys who came down to save her yep. used the, the tow ball. Now, the tow ball is a big, big no-no. Now, I don't like saying this, but if the stress is really low that's and you're experienced and you know what you're doing and you know then sure nothing's gonna break and come off but the reason why we don't ever ever put anything on it um is the fact that other people will see that and then they'll they'll do it and then they just give it like a lot of shit and when they do that they can shear off and in australia we have lost uh you know over a handful of lives from toe balls coming off yep so what could have been done instead, which would have been really simple, is simply pull the tow bar out, use the pin, put the strap in there. Because they had the recovery gear. Yep. Like you could tell it was a snatch strap the way it pulled the car out. Yep. And you could also tell that he was very easy with it and he was gentle when he, when he pulled it out. So th- there's experience, but it's still, it's still not done the right way. That's not how I, I would do it. But you could also... Uh, wrap the strap around the tow assembly because then you got that whole tow assembly bar. Right. And if you use a recovery point, it's attached to that whole thing anyway. So that's another way of avoiding using a tow ball. Yeah, okay. So that, I suppose it was slow and steady. Yeah. The risk of that is, I suppose, reduced, but it's still, you know, yeah, it's, a, a it's advice still would be to advice of, yeah. use the pin and take yeah. that tow ball out. So for people... Um, if people want to see what happens when tow balls actually come off, I've done a whole video where we um, we were snapping tow balls on purpose and just sending them flying one, into just things. Just got bored one day. And no, well, we wanted to show people <laughs> yeah, what Yeah, it's an important what, what I have yeah, seen that yeah. video and it's very, it is a, it, yeah. it's mind-blowing what they can do. It, 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 it's, it's frightening. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. But even the strap itself, you know, if, if that strap comes loose, that, that's enough to do it's some serious enough, yeah. damage. So yeah. much energy in, in that recovery stuff. Um, we should definitely do a do an episode on, on recoveries because yeah. a lot of people think you need a snatch strap where you can use something else or, you know, do a different method, I should say. But it's the same with winch. Everyone thinks you need a winch. In that situation, winch would have been great. Yep. That's, that's insurance. But a winch is also a lot of money. Yep. And... You know, yeah, I've got a winch on mine. Never had to use it, but I suppose the time that you do, you do need it. It's, it's yeah, it's it's insurance. Pay for itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Would well, have saved the four and a half grand. Yeah, that's true. Possibly. Yeah, winch doesn't cost that much, does it? What's a winch? I can't uh, remember. A good one. Yeah, she would have had a bit of change from the four and a half. Yeah, yeah. So maybe like two grand, two. Yeah, probably about two grand. Then you got all your other gear you buy with it so you're probably looking at two and a half three grand yeah right yeah yeah installed yeah yeah well mate i think that uh that just about wraps us up is there anything else you, you want to touch on in this about the area about the well let's stuck there? yeah well because she's so close to air bird Observ- observatory she's in between the twilight cove and the air bird observatory there's a cool story about because we're talking about her walking right yep um there's a cool story about john uh john air so that's what the observatory is named after. So he used to run that telegraph little station because it used to be a telegraph station. Now it's a museum. Really cool to check right. out. That's easy to get to from the highway. You can drive down there and come back up. Yep. They do offer a place to stay as well. But what's really cool is back in the day, they definitely made kids a lot harder back then, right? <laughs> His kids, uh, I think you have three girls um, and the youngest one was six. They would, if they were, got bored wanted to go do something they would walk from there to twilight cove along the beach and that walk is 20 30k there's wild dingoes there's all kinds of stuff out there heaps of jugot snakes as, yes. as we spoke about earlier and they would walk there and back and that would be their thing they do for the day yeah 
It's and, incredible. And one of his daughters actually got um, uh, attacked by dingo. She managed to climb up a tree, but they ruined ruined the saddle on the horse. And I think the horse ran off too. Far out. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. They do make kids tougher these uh, back Wild. then because I'm not even thinking about yeah. walking 25, 30 k just to get to a nice spot on the <laughs> beach. <laughs> um, mate, I think we should thank Nina again, obviously, and, yeah. and Teddy for, for, you know, obviously coming on and doing an interview with yourself and, and providing us with all this vision and photos and, and giving people just that insight into how it can go wrong. And I think that there's, you know, it takes yeah. a lot of courage to probably put that out there as well. So And also to, to, to relive it. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. It's obviously, um, yeah, I, you'd sort of get a few shaky feelings the next couple of times on the yeah. beach, no doubt. But obviously she's very experienced, got herself out. And, and she um, would have gained so much more experience from, that, from that too. Yep. You know, yep. I mean, we all, we all learn from making mistakes and that's not necessarily a mistake. No. That's the situation. Just unlucky and yeah. yeah. We thank Nina and Teddy for, for jumping on board. That's it for us, mate. Um, you'll find us at the Four Wheel Drive podcast on Instagram, YouTube, all episodes on Backchat. Southern River Band will get us out of here, mate. Appreciate it. Thanks Cheers, Liam. Me.